Welcome. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Fantastic. So um, we're going to get one more minute for people to come in from the break. Um, and then we're going to start. And off we go. I hope you all had a wonderful DrupalCon so far and really enjoyed it. Let me know. Yeah. Can't do that a little louder. Come on. Woo! OK, and you are all here today to stream your way to success. Because there's different ways to um, achieving success, and streaming is one of them, apparently. So we're talking today about Big Pipe, Refreshless, ESI, Ajax, and more. A big welcome to you. Just as a beginner, uh, beginning, a little disclaimer. This is a beginner session. So if you're not a beginner, you need to leave right now, immediately. Unless you're here for the demos or want to know what crazy things I have been working on now. Then you can obviously stay or for any other reason. So, who am I? I'm Fabian Franz, AK Fabian X. And by the way, if you ever wondered what's that X, first it's a lowercase X, not an uppercase. And that originally did stand for Fabian and Linux, because I really also want an X extension. I'm at Fabian Franz on Twitter. I work for Techmon Consulting as a senior performance engineer, technical lead. And high performance is really what I grok, what I love, what I live. And I recently got appointed to be a Drupal 7 core maintainer, a framework manager to be precise. So if you've got any patches in Drupal 7 that haven't seen activity in a long time, now is probably a good time to set them to RTBC, if you think they're ready, and get them committed. Because um, we are going to give Drupal 7 a little renaissance. I was born at the same day as GNU, um, the free software foundation statement made by Richard Stallman. So I'm purely living open source history, which was found on September 27, 1983. Oh my god, that day is today. I want to bring a cake, but the auditorium was a little too large for that. Um, but I'll have some demos for you later. Just no cake. But enough about me. Who are you? I think I know who you are. Let me get to know you, because I know you are all are pirates. And you are eager to conquer the seas of performance. So who of you want a faster site? OK. Who of you downed? OK. Uh, never mind. 100% uh, if you want a faster site, that's really nice. But how do you get one? The answer is 42. Uh, no, wrong track. No, the answer is ACD. Um, please don't mix that up with ACDC. That's something completely different. ACD, does anyone remember what that stands for? Huh? Oh, anyone? No? Maybe, ah, oh, there, maybe in the last line there. Um, I'll tell you, it's a void cache defair. And so you don't get lost today in my session here. You are here. We are de dealing today purely with the defair part of it. We'll also get a little into caching, but there's also great sessions at the StrupalCon which will deal with um, the other parts. And just to reiterate that a little more, um, First of all, if you can avoid doing the work, do so. There's no need to keep your computer running hot if the work you are producing isn't even used. Second, if you can't avoid doing it, cache it. And the third part is, if you can't cache it and you can't avoid it, at least let, don't let your users suffer for it. For example, um, there's a possibility in Drupal 8 where you have a kernel events terminate event. And if your infrastructure is using PHP FPM, 
aka fast CGI, um, when we are using that, then you will actually be able to do work after the request has been finished, after it all has been sent to the user already, similar to how BigPipe does things. Just you won't be able to communicate with the user anymore. That's the different part from the streaming. But so, if, for example, if you need to do complex operations and uh, caches that you need to revalidate, you could explore the strategy of just giving the user outdated data, if that's possible from your business model, and then at the end of the request, when everything is finished, regenerate that cache, and so you're always getting fast responses. But why would you defare? You might know that little problem, and you probably all had that already. You have built this huge social network, and it really doesn't matter what it's called, and you have all this very complex content there in this social network. It all works really great. It's tailored perfectly to a user's needs. And there's just this one little problem you have, this very, very little problem. It's really not a big deal overall. Yes, it takes 3.5 seconds to load. That are 3,500 milliseconds. And, well, maybe that is a big deal. Maybe that even is a deal breaker, and maybe users are even leaving your site for it. So what do you do about that? You need a wonder, a perfect wonder, and it needs to be a fast wonder. So you transform yourself into Gandalf. Other magicians had not been available at the time of the making of this presentation, just as disclaimer, and smoke a pipe. Just so you know, smoking is not endorsed in any way. It's purely used for the comical purposes here. And um, while that's not a pipe, that's a pipe uh, leaf where you can make some wonderful things out of Hobbit land. And you smoke a big pipe. And you think, what if I cheat? What if I give the user the impression that the site is really loading fast, even though in reality it's not? And that is perceived performance. And this perceived performance is so much more important than actually what your server is doing. For this user, it just matters um, when he can start interacting with your site and when he can start seeing your site. Because he might be on Google, he might have found some content, now he clicks and has to wait and wait and close the window. But if the user is seeing anything, even just sometimes like a loading or any feedback. Then the user knows, wow, that site is alive. I get to my content in a moment. Um, so they'll be less likely to leave. Perceived performance by now is that important that web test base, um, some of you probably have used the web test, um, is doing a full survey Maybe you've taken it, maybe not. If not, you could. Um, where you get A-B testing and you have to choose which site you perceive loading faster. So there's a whole science around that now. And that's why it's so important. And that's exactly what Facebook does since ages and LinkedIn since a while. Um, they are cheating. Actually, with Facebook, you have an option to turn their big pipe technology off and I'm kidding you not, it takes those 3.5 seconds. So um, it's not that our complex systems are slow. It's not that they are not nicely built. It is that complex sites take time, that it takes time to deliver this value to your users. And um, that is why you can use perceived performance to do that. And that's what Drupal 8, out of the box, can now do too. In 8.1.0, BigPipe and at core as an experimental module. And in 8.20, uh, it will be beta stability. So um, we even thought about making it stable already. So now really is the time to try it out. Um, and I just grab a cafe here where you all get out your laptops and are probably just busy trying the big pipe out right now. Uh, no? Okay. You want? No? Oh, that's not enough? Okay, let's continue. What is streaming? 
Streaming is available since HTTP 1.1 was released in June 1999. It's pretty simple. You send a content encoding of this is chunked content. Then you send a transfer coding of chunk. That's usually what web servers and PHP and all those are all doing automatically. You don't have to deal with anything like that. Um, so it's available since a long time. By now, almost all proxies support it. Um, and streaming is very simple. So that's a streamed response. You just use a PHP script, say, hello. You flush that, putting it out. Then you sleep for a while, where normally you would do your complex operations, and then you hear, say, world. And that's it. Hello, my world. Um, so this previous PHP script is something I actually use because this is the easiest way to check. Oh, it was too fast. This is the easiest way to check to see if your site is actually ready for streaming, if your infrastructure, your stack, if everything supports it. Because you might be using something else and you don't know, huh, where's the problem? Is it my streaming? Is it something else? No, um, this is the script to use. Um, yeah, your stack needs to be ready. So how can you see that you are streaming a response? Um, that's pretty simple to see. You are using the, for example, Chrome developer tools and you're taking a look at the request there. And when you then go on the request tab, on the actual, for example, index PHP or test PHP, whatever you call it. And um, then you go to the details of that thing. Then you see three values. When the request was sent, the waiting, the time to first byte, which is so important because before the browser is not getting the first byte, it can't do anything, at least with HTTP 1. With HTTP 2, there might be other things, but yeah, we'll see how um, the graphs then change in that. But as long as the browser doesn't have received anything from the server, um, it can't do anything. It can just wait, wait, and wait, and wait. And then the response comes, and then the browser can start up to get up the CSS, get up the JavaScript, get the images, and all of that. But what we are doing here, and this is what it means we are ready for streaming, is we have a very, very fast time to first byte, 0 0.94 milliseconds. And that's obviously just locally. Um, and then we have a long content download. So if you see a long blue bar and a little green bar, then you are ready. Um, but if it looks like this, then you are not ready. Because that means the browser needs to wait 12 seconds or 10 seconds for that script to come back. And the browser needs to, um, can't do anything in that. And then there's a short content download of one millisecond. Um, so that is um, how you can determine that. And um, that's important. What is streaming in a more advanced example? Um, you might have um, your infrastructure and you use NGNX, for example. And NGNX supports one flag which is called XXL buffering. And you just can tell um, NGNX that it shouldn't buffer the things and you have streaming. So the other header, and we are trying to standardize that across uh, different implementations that we've integrated in Drupal 8 is a server grade control. We're sending um, a control to, for example, a varnish system, which is um, a store where um, you can cache things, if you're not aware of that, that is. And um, then you can tell the varnish um, that this is a big pipe response and it shouldn't store it, and the content is actually a streamed response. And with that, um, you can make your infrastructure ready for streaming when the server says, hey, now a streamed response is coming, but not otherwise. Um, and that's pretty good 
because um, that makes your infrastructure tuning easier. Because the server needs to know it uses streaming. So there's some more configuration needed. So the server requirements are pretty simple for streaming. There's a way more extensive documentation page on um, Drupal.org. For a LAMP system, it works out of the box. So if you're just having Linux, Apache, MySQL with mod PHP, no problem, just works. With NGINX, thanks to that header flag we just sent, it works out of the box. For Varnish, you need three lines of code that I didn't put in here because they're already in the extensive documentation for BigPipe on Drupal.org. And Fastly, for example, it also works out of the box. Just one example of a CDN that supports it because they already have the uh, streaming available, available always. So now that our server is ready, let's get our code ready too. Let's take a look at how we can do streaming in Drupal 7 and 8. And as this is a beginner session, um, we are gonna take a look at the groundwork, not the highly complex systems, we are getting to that later, but we are looking at it, how we would be doing it now if we were to do everything manually. In Drupal 8, you would just use the streamed response, and then from your controller, you would return your new streamed response uh, with a function. And um, you might know that PHP script inside of the anonymous function there. That is just our PHP script that we've used for testing before. So there's a streamed response. It's not very powerful, but it works for um, simple cases. In Drupal 7, it's a little bit more complicated um, because in your hook menu where you define a route for your streamed response, like my big pipe stream or whatever you want to call it, um, you have to set a delivery callback. Um, because a delivery callback will mean that first your menu is called and once your menu controller returns, and in this case I'm again returning just a closure, a function, and then in the callback of the delivery callback, I call that function. So that's possible too. Um, as you can see, the concept is always the same. We're having like some dynamic data we are creating, in this case, an anonymous closure. And then in the callback, we finally send that out. And because now we have control over the output buffer, um, we can actually um, flush some data, the next part, flush some data, the next part. And that's kind of how my prototype in uh, Drupal 7 for a big pipe worked. Um, I've taken the response I was getting from Drupal and I was splitting it at the body tag or a special big pipe tag and then I was um, taking that, sending the first thing, flushing, and then sending the rest of the placeholders, which was at the time just some JavaScript. So if that's so easy, because not really complex example, why has no one used that before? As I said, the technology is available since 1999, um, but there's no real usage of that. The reason is pretty simple, it's not practical. Because usually you don't want to just send some hello world that makes for great tech demos if you make it up, um, but you have the very practical business need that the site looks the same as without that streaming. And for the user, nothing changes. It should be exactly the same experience, except that it's faster, of course. So the question is, what do you want to stream? You could stream nothing. That's the default, that doesn't help. You could stream everything, but then it would be a very, a page that would be just empty at the beginning and then there would be some content there, then a sidebar appearing, a menu there, and um, it would get very jumpy. That's probably also not a good idea. What about every block? That could also work, but it would mean your whole sidebar would be completely empty at the start. Might not be what you want. What about specially configured blocks? Oh, that would definitely work, and I know that um, David Garcia has made a prototype he's yet to release on Drupal.org, unfortunately, to just configure a big pipe-like functionality in Drupal 7 on a block, and, um, and then you can configure that per block. Um, 
that's really nice, but what do you do if it's not a block? Because um, while in Drupal 8, we also have as our primary use case at the moment blocks, uh, there's nothing stopping you from taking any entity and putting this in some dynamic content which you stream. And we'll take a look at how we're doing that later. Um, the solution is we want to stream just the dynamic parts of the page. And as it happens, those are usually also the uncacheable parts of the page or which are way too granular for caching. Because if you say like you have a page and you have a shopping cart, then you really don't want to cache that page again and again and again for all different shopping carts for all different users. That's not what you want. So those are candidates for caching, um, for streaming. Now the question is, how do you identify those dynamic parts? So how do you find the dynamic part? And the idea is pretty simple. You placeholder it. You placeholder everything that is too dynamic. And you also allow the code that you can specify that this can be independently rendered, that you give the system information. That's what the whole caching approach in Drupal 8 is about, to give the system information so that it can make smart choices for you, so that you don't have to configure everything, anything. Um, the thing is in Drupal 7, it worked always like that. You were going into this panel, then you were going there into the Google configuration, then you were clicking there, you were looking at that part, then you were um, configuring that cache plugin like that, but because that cache plugin is three levels deep, you now have to configure a three chain invalidation expiration route, um, but because there's some specialty, you have to configure something else, but that short thing lives in a view, which again needs some different caching rules, and you can see it gets very complicated very fast. And um, that's the reality of many sites, that you either you say, oh, I don't care, cache that for six hours and we're done. Um, and the editors then have the experience of, well, I know my content will appear in six hours. It's less than ideal, but it works. Or you are saying, I'm setting up these complex systems. And um, Drupal 8 is doing a different approach. It's not doing the top-down approach where you configure everything. And every site builder, every site owner has some maintenance burden. We flipped it around. Now you as developers or non-developers, or if you're not a developer, you are lucky in that regard. Now the developers have um, the burden of defining everything for them. So that the developer says, this is user cacheable, this is cacheable per page, um, this is like that. And because we share the responsibility with all items that are on the page as everything declares itself, we have full knowledge and you don't have to configure anything. It works out of the box. Um, and that's kind of how it works graphically. So you have a shopping cart. It has said, I need to be definitely be per user or even per user session because um, the shopping cart should never be, no one should ever see what my shopping cart is accidentally. And then there's a different block and you put a placeholder. And um, by putting a placeholder, you're making all of that possible. And to make a placeholder, you just put in an attached placeholders and render array. And Drupal 8 makes this very easy. You have cache tags, cache contacts, and max page. This is not session for it, but we are simple. Drupal 8 knows for everything how to invalidate it, what to vary it on, and how long to cache it. So things that are uncacheable will say max h0. I am never cacheable, not at all. Don't do that. Things that are too granular say I have a cache context of user, for example. And that's exactly what Drupal 8 does. It has rules in um, the services YML where you can define the configuration of what your most granular cache contexts are. Like if you want to, if you have something else what you're varying on, like a custom cache context, and you know it's 
very frequently and you never want to cache that, you can say, put a placeholder. Or another example, which is pretty cool, you have a news site and you have an article and you have a sidebar and in the sidebar you have something which always needs to show the most current news. No exceptions, never ever. What you are doing is you're defining a tag for that block, like say it's a news block, then there's some tag for it, config, column, block, and um, in that config column block you can define that it should automatically placeholder whenever it encounters that tag. So you don't have to configure anything except in this case the configuration you want to have. That's a little top down but it's globally managed and Drupal then figures out how to placeholder it, where to put it, and in the end it's rendered and it's always count. And now we can automatically placeholder it. So and that's the bottom up approach I already talked about. And what makes all of that possible is lazy builders. Because lazy builders give us the guarantee that they are independently renderable and have no outside dependencies. They also give us a guarantee of not being difficult to store. Because what happened before was um, we had pre-render cache pattern. So when you want to cache something, you put in a render array, a pre-render function, and a cache. The problem is those pre-render you could put in a whole object like a node. Now you could of course take that serialize that to disk but that node might have another entity which is a user and an image and something else and you would store all of that. And that's not practical because in the end the unserialization of that would take more time than to build it in the first place. So lazy builders really say we don't have outside dependencies. So if you want to auto placeholder dynamic content, that's pretty simple. You just put a lazy builder and you say the cache is max h0. Something important here that's not on the slides but for you as a secret. Um, you don't have to specify the max h0 here. We automatically determine that if that lazy builder after it has been rendered was not cacheable, we will now, and we will then create a placeholder after the fact. So um, even if there's something deep buried somewhere in the system that's uncacheable, the next lazy builder that it encounters will make it a placeholder. The other thing is um, you can directly force a placeholder you set up your lazy builder here for node one and you say create placeholder true. An edge case, but one we had in core, that's why I'm putting it here, is you want to force a placeholder always. That means you define your lazy builder like usual and then you directly put in an attached placeholders. And I've used my unique placeholder in just little brackets um, as my ID and there's my markup. I've added some diffs just for more decay. It's a pleasure. Um, and obviously you need to be careful. If you do something like um, hello as a placeholder, then you can replace everything that has hello on that page. So please don't use words that could appear in your content. Uh, there's a placeholder generator which you can inject into your service uh, if you really need to. Usually you don't have to force a placeholder. I'm just giving you the opportunities. It's possible. It's a simple context. It lives in attached. Um, you can do anything with that. You can even inspect that, change it, um, but it's for a more advanced use case. The last thing is what if you have a lazy builder with dependencies? What if that block needs to show um, or your custom code needs to show something that determines on the current node? Then you can actually inject that node into it. So it would not be that the lazy builder would be calling out which root currently is active. That's calling out into global state. That's something we don't want. Um, 
But instead, what you want to do is you want to say, hey, this render array, I've taken a look at the root, and I've gotten the, gotten the node. So now my render array is varying by this root. So I'm having to set a cache context of root. And then, and it's very, very important that this is a child item. Um, you are actually um, putting the lazy builder in, like you can call it lazy builder or whatever. Um, the key doesn't matter. It just needs to be at a different level. Because um, and now this lazy builder has the node inserted into it. It will always render node one. And it will always be the same placeholder that's created for that. And that's a little misunderstanding we even had in core. <laughs> it was very hard to get to understand that what is coming from the outside and what's getting into the inside. So um, if you don't understand that fully, no problem. It was really hard and core developers also struggled with it. So we have all of that now and it's still not fast. And your bus comes and says, hey, we made the infrastructure and all those changes. And I've had my engineers working for a week to change everything to Nginx and still not fast. And now oh, it's streaming and yeah. yeah, not so good. So now we split our 3.5 seconds up. We have two seconds for our content load and 1.5 seconds for the stream placeholders. So our perf Perceived performance, our UX, is now down to at least two seconds. But why is that? And the reason is that Drupal still needs to build the whole site because it builds everything except the placeholders. Because the reason is we are not caching anything yet. But the remainder is actually perfectly cacheable because we've now taken all the dynamics, all the placeholders, everything, that is um, there, everything um, that has made our page uncacheable, it's all no longer there, there's just placeholders. And because there's no dynamic parts anymore, uh, in Drupal 8 we just added a dynamic page cache, which is authenticated user caching out of the box in every Drupal 8 site. No more dealing with auth cache, no more dealing with complex configuration, no more dealing with rules. It's enabled out of the box. So on this page, maybe we inherited it from the Drupal 8 beta phase, but it was not yet enabled. We enabled it and like magic, down to 35 milliseconds. And then 1.5 seconds of streaming. So let's take a look at a big pipe demo. There's personalized slow cacheable content and there's personalized slow and uncacheable content because what you're currently listening to is not. And then there's the comment form that's also just for you as a user. And now take a look. There's traditional versus big pipe. And woo, wow, big pipe is already there. And traditional, how are we still waiting? And that was with cold caches. Okay. And there was the same total time there. But now with warm caches, and again, big pipe wins. It's just there, and now you can see the block is coming and what you are listening to. Um, so that's so important um, that actually um, you're dealing with the um, same thing there. And um, Big Pipe allows you here um, to just see those blocks appearing afterwards. Let me show you that quickly again, if I can. Here. That's not yet there. Now, Big Pipe is coming, the first block that's slow and cacheable. And after a while, then it comes. And that's important because for the user, it doesn't matter if they're what they're listening comes at a little later. But for um, uh, the user, it does matter that he can immediately see something. So if you want a perceived, I had another demo, but we don't have time for that. If you want a perceived fast site in Drupal 8, you just enable the big pipe experimental module and you're done. Maybe you need to declare your custom dynamic parts, but that's it. So let's say practical example, you're having an entity and entities are not lazy builderable at the moment. 
I made an experimental core patch, it worked, but it's not in core. So within your entity, you're having like, let's say the current time, and you really want to show that current time, or what the user is listening to. So all you do is within your entity building, within your callback of the entity view, when you're returning your render array, you don't call the function directly, but you put it in a lazy builder. And you put the node in as spoken, the entity you are viewing. And then, like magic, Drupal 8 will see, oh, there's a lazy builder. I can placeholder that. It will placeholder it and automatically will have a placeholder and your entity and your whole page will be cached without that. But then, at the end of the page request, it will put it in. And that's how it works. And then you enable big pipe, and then your page will load completely, and then there will be a little free space. Maybe you need to style it a little, but you can do that because it's your custom code, and it will appear. And I heard a story from Dries. There was once upon a time a site that had performance problems, and they enabled big patterns of problems have just gone away. So it works. Hmm? Ways of streaming. The idea of placeholders is not new. Larry likes to say everything that is old is new again. What is new here is the idea of auto placeholdering is. Because another way to do that is ESI. And that's very simple, you just put a tag there. And again, that has been a long since a long time. But again, it was not that really practical to do because there have been challenges, custom code, many did it. But it was not something you could enable working out of the box. But ESI is easy now too. Thanks to lazy builders and placeholders, you just define a new ESI placeholder strategy, hash the placeholders in the database, define a root ESI fragment hash, and you're done. Or for Ajax, you put the placeholders in Drupal settings and use JavaScript to replace the placeholders. So all of that you can combine. You could have some things that are loaded via big pipe, some things that are Ajax, some that are ESI. But there's one big difference of Ajax and ESI and big pipe. For ESI and Ajax, you have N requests, you have N full bootstraps. And I've just recently seen a site that was using Auscache and it was doing 11 requests on every page load. That can really kill your site performance. And with BigPipe, you have one request, you have several inline responses, and it's way better for cold cache performance. So be creative and combine, write your own render strategies, write your own placeholder strategies, or let your developers write them. Future Outlook. There's ESI big pipe, um, response from the edge CDN, and then stream the rest later. So your user gets literally like a two millisecond or five millisecond response time related to how fast he is to the CDN. Unfortunately, support in Fastly is uh, just um, soon. I heard the patch is ready. It was written last RubelCon by a developer that was there, but it's not yet in production. So I unfortunately can't show. And in Varnish, I've made a patch for version three available, which can be found on my GitHub lines at, um, but they didn't accept it. And version four was so far too complicated to get that in. Um, I still hope to work with them a little to get that in because um, while currently the page itself can be streamed, an ESI fragment cannot. Um, what about Drupal 7? Unfortunately for Drupal 7, there's just prototype implementations and the one by David Garcia, which is, as far as I know, still not now up on Drupal.org. But there's major work on core itself by me. Um, so get out your laptops, phones, whatever. I all want you to open up this node 2754245. Four, Isn't that awesome? Um, and review my patch right now. Because with reviews, we can get that in. Because what this patch does, it does attachments collectors. It solves the Drupal at JS problem of global state. 
And what it will enable is that we have all that bubbling of Drupal 8 where we can ensure that never any data gets lost is in Drupal 7 as well. The concept is very simple. You just have a subscriber pattern and for anything that's storing something in global state, um, we are putting it instead to everyone that's listening to currently global state changes. And with that, you just create your new Drupal attachments collector, you get the attachments, and you're done. And with that, for example, if you try out the patch, block cache, you enable it, all assets you get. Render cache, it just works. Early rendering, no problems. Render cache the module, I just had a site, I want to have render cache for some commerce stuff there. And then it had custom code Drupal HAS. Contrib code Drupal HAS. And I could have patched that all and changed and everything, but it just put in my core patch, boom, immediately worked. So um, it solves this real problem and one very old issue with the block cache. But this is something that really needs to be fixed in core because views tried, panels tried, I tried also hard, and it's just not possible. Um, if you try to do it without core support, you can do hacks, but you won't get it right. And that's very, very important base work. Because I need your help. Your help, your help, your help, and your help. Because together, we can bring back the important parts of the Drupal 8 caching system to Drupal 7, including Big Pipe. Um, you might ask yourself how you can help. You can either contact me, you can send your developers, you can come to the sprint on Friday, or you could uh, sponsor me for some work as a grant. Um, like um, Drupal 8 that was very successful. Um, developers were getting grants and working on critical issues, and that did get a lot done. For example, for ex now I'm getting a, got a grant by the Drupal Association to make our testing system faster, which will hopefully help everyone. Um, and um, that's one possibility. But developers that are still using Drupal 7 and um, will be stuck with Drupal 7 for a while and want some more nice caching system and big pipe and everything, come to me. Um, please a round of applause also for Wimlias and Akia who sponsored the big pipe work on Drupal 8 and parts of the Drupal 8 caching system. Thank you. And the session says refresh list, so we are doing that. Refresh list has nothing directly to do with streaming, but it's based on our Drupal 8 caching work. You see it's very things, and now with TurboLinks, which is now called refresh list, uh, you see it's very seamless transition, and um, there's no more problems in that. So you can have an app-like experience with the experimental refresh list module, um, and you will have um, nice time. It is streaming related, however, because it's actually possible to also stream JSON responses. You just have to use a dot progress event of um, JavaScript. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you. The question was uh, if I could elaborate on JavaScript events since DOM ready isn't DOM ready anymore. And that's perfectly right. Um, I tried first to fake the DOM ready event, which didn't quite work. But fortunately, um, we designed that in Drupal 8 we won't be dealing with DOM ready. So if you want to do something which you would have normally done in DOM ready, you're doing it in a behavior attachment. Your site will behave like if it was loaded, and then you were sending out 11 or whatever AJAX requests. So you will get an um, Drupal attached behaviors on the whole document once the initial part has been sent, so the page can then be completely ready, and then for every placeholder replaced, 
you get another attached behaviors just for that part in the context. Does that answer the question? Cool. Yep. Sure. Oh, there we are. Further questions? Yes, just one request, it's just longer, exactly. More questions? Ah, there. Yes, um, there has been a lot of work to reduce the bootstrap, but especially in Drupal 8, there's a lot of class loading going on, and you can't really cache that in a way. Um, there's routing going on, container loading, it all takes time. So um, we already try to send back as soon as possible the response, and I'm actually working on a faster page cache which would live in a pre-kernel middleware, which is this bootstrap container possible, so at least for page cache you could have fast responses, and probably also for some of the easier lazy builders. But overall, uh, it's very, very difficult to reduce the bootstrap and make it faster, uh, just from the object-oriented overhead. Uh, no, what, uh, the full bootstrap in my example had been with 35 milliseconds. That's around what our bootstrap takes, 70 milliseconds to 35 milliseconds. Depending on if you're, if you're not yet using PHP 7, please look into it both for Drupal 7 and 8. Uh, Drupal 8 completely fully supports it, it's well worth it, so much faster. And Drupal 7, with the exception of one sorting issue, we are also kind of ready to say, uh, Drupal 7 is, is, is ready for PHP 7. More questions, please. Seems there's no more questions, so I'm doing one more thing. Um, if you want to try out the caching, it didn't fit in really in the session anymore, unfortunately, even though I had planned it. Please check out RenderVis. RenderVis is a project with which you can use a JavaScript console to actually see what varies on what. Um, is, let me see, maybe I can get a browser up. Um, So with uh, RenderVis, you can um, can actually see um, how the site is is performing, how the site is, um, what is cached, what is uncacheable, what is max h zero. Um, so um, that's something to also um, try out. Maybe I can show the video. Let me see. <laughs> so um, with RenderVis, what you can see is um, you see in the JavaScript console at the bottom, you see all your cache tags, all your cache contacts that are on the site. Um, once you um, look at it, you can 
uh, put into the JavaScript console a command render this, and you can say, I want to see everything that's max h0. And then it will visually show you what is uncacheable on that side. You can also focus in on the matched elements, um, so you can see that um, and uh, see the grandparent for that. You can visualize the cache context, what your site is varying on. And um, I recently used that myself because I was on a site and I couldn't figure out why something was not there. So I um, took a look which cache contacts are there and then I could find out where that was actually happening that um, was not like that. So uh, that's a great tool um, where you can really see how your site is working. And um, it's not that user-friendly right now, but um, if you can improve it a little more, I think it could get to be an indispensable tool for debugging cacheability in Drupal 8. I have a question. Yep. Uh, does RenderVis work with the latest Drupal right now? Yes. Um, we just applied the critical patch, oh. and um, a Vim just, on my request, released 0 alpha 1. Okay, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. Have a great day, have a great DrupalCon. And um, if you want to see more of me and like high performance tomorrow at um, 2.15 in Druid Room, there will be a four times high performance step-by-step, -step, uh, one of my all-time favorite sessions um, and should be fun. That was a backup replacement for another session. Um, but the topic is very similar, so thank you.